All right, so we're in Genesis 15. Genesis 15 is a chapter that I will continually be reminding you of. It will be a chapter that ought to be <clears throat> a kind of linchpin in your thinking, especially when you get to the New Testament, which I know is a way off. But you cannot forget Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, God enters into a self-maledictory oath, which means that he takes an oath against himself if he does not perform the very words of the oath that he makes at the end of that chapter, Genesis 15. This is what they did. Now, in order to show that, what I want to do is to turn you to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 34. Now, chapter 34 of Jeremiah, we'll be coming back to and we'll be parking on and taking some time looking at it because it is an extremely important chapter. Um, in fact, a lot of my understanding of what we call biblical theology is built on Jeremiah chapters 30 through 34, which might seem very odd, but... A, maybe I'm a bit odd. B, when we get there, maybe you'll understand why that is. Okay? It's not kind of a natural place to go, but if you've been reading the Bible a lot and studying the Bible a lot, then maybe it would make, uh, make sense to you that uh, that would be an attractive place um, to go because uh, it's basically halfway in the Bible. And it's also towards the end of the Old Testament era with, um, with the southern kingdom, Judah, and some of the other, the other tribes, just trickles of the other <coughs> tribes, going into captivity in Babylon. And then that's the end of national Israel in their own land uh, with their own sovereignty. That's it up until 1948. So it's, uh, it's really adventitious to, for us to look at those chapters to see what God says about what he's already promised to do. Um, also, it's, it's helpful for us to uh, have clear moorings and clear signals about what we are to do moving forward into the New Testament. So, uh, that's to come. But I want to call your attention to this passage in Jeremiah 34. Some of you, because I know that you've all been avid readers of the book of Jeremiah, um, will be familiar with this chapter, with this story. It is Zedekiah, the last king of uh, the southern kingdom with the... Bab Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar outside the gates of the city, ready to come in. He decides this is a good time to take God seriously, if only for a moment. And so, he does something. And uh, what he does is described actually by God. It shows you that God has been watching what he's done and has kind of waited until the whole transaction and everything that was in Zedekiah's heart has been made uh, manifest. That's a very interesting thing also. That he didn't just stop halfway and say, well done. But because he knew what was in <coughs> Zedekiah's heart, he knew that he was not a man of God, not a man of faith, uh, that he vacillated in uh, his uh, worship of God that he waited until 
what happened next. And then he spoke. So, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, all the kingdoms of the earth um, under his dominion and all the people, fought against Jerusalem and all its cities, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. And you shall not escape his hand, but shall surely be taken and delivered into his hand. Your eyes shall see the eyes of the king of Babylon. He shall speak with you face to face, and you shall go <coughs> to Babylon. Yet, hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you, you shall not die by the sword. You shall die in peace as in the ceremonies of your fathers, the former kings who were before you. So they shall burn incense for you and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, for we have pronounced the word. Sorry, for I have pronounced the word, says the Lord. All right. Thanks, darling. And, uh, oh, she's gone. Just gone. All right. Ah, there we are. Right. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah, king of Judah in Jerusalem. When the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and all the cities of Judah that were left against Lachish and Azekar, for only these fortified cities remained of the cities of Judah. All right. There's the backdrop. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after... King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them. What was the oath? Here it is. That every man should set free his male and female slave, a Hebrew man or woman, that no one should keep a Jewish brother in bondage. Now when all the princes and all the people who had entered into the covenant, heard that everyone should set free his male and female slaves, that no one should keep them in bondage anymore. They obeyed and let them go, which is exactly what they should have done. Why did they obey and let them go? Again, the answer is simple, because they took the oath at face value. You've got to have it clear in your minds that the oath means what it says. Okay? It's an end of all disagreement as only as long as it means what it says. But, verse 11, afterward they changed their minds and made the male and female slaves return whom they had set free and brought them into subjection as male and female slaves. Therefore, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Do you remember this? <laughs> saying, At the end of seven years, let every man set free his Hebrew brother who has been sold to him. And when he has served you six years, you shall let him go free from you. This is part of the Mosaic covenant. This is one of the stipulations uh, in the Mosaic Covenant that they swore to uphold. But your fathers did not obey me nor incline their ear. Then you recently turned and did what was right in my sight, every man proclaiming liberty to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Now, this chapter is all about what th God thinks about covenants. Because what God thinks about covenants is what we should think about covenants. Then you turned around and profaned my name. That's the first thing. Profaned my name. And every one of you brought back his male and female slaves whom you had set at liberty at their pleasure and brought them back into subjection to be your male and female slaves. So to, uh, to obey a covenant of God is to glorify God's name. 
And to disobey it is to profane God's name. And again, please understand that you can only obey it if it means what it says, and you can only disobey it if it means what it says. Otherwise, how would you know whether you've obeyed it or disobeyed it? Therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 17, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty every one to his brother and every one to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you, says the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to famine. There's a bit of irony there, if you haven't seen. And I will deliver you to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth. Now look at this next verse. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it. The princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. Their dead bodies shall be for meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and so on and so forth. Now, what's going on here? What's happening is that Zedekiah and his nobles make a covenant before God in God's house. And it's very clear what the covenant was about. And it says that the people understood what the covenant was about. They were to let their slaves, male and female Jewish slaves, go free. Okay? Obviously, they'd been holding them as slaves and they were not obeying the, um, the statute of God. But God said, that was my statute and you did right by finally obeying it. And you did right by swearing a covenant to me in the temple to do this. And then your wicked nature's got the better of you and you profaned my name and you went back on the covenant. It's not just that they went back on their word because the covenant is more solemn than that. They went back on an oath that they took before God. And so God is holding them to the words of that oath. Do you see that? He says, because you did not perform the words of the covenant that you made before me. Basically, you're going to be judged. Notice that they pass between the parts of an animal here, the calf. This is the only other place in the Bible that you have um, somebody passing through the parts of divided animals. Uh, it's not, uh, not particularly common in the ancient world. Don't think that this was a common thing, at least as far as we know. But it was very, it's very clear from the context what's going on in Genesis 15 when God did it. And here in Jeremiah 34 when Zedekiah and the nobles did it. This raises an interesting theological issue. The issue is this. Does God hold sinners to a higher standard than he holds himself? In other words, can God, if he's pointing out, remember Jesus and, you know, the, the speck in your own eye and the, uh, oh, sorry, the beam in your eye, get that out before you um, examine the speck in your brother's eye. Can the God who said that hold Zedekiah and his nobles to a literal performance of the words of the covenant if, he does not intend to do the same 
with the covenant that he made. Let that sink into you, please. You might think, well, you know, this is an easy question. It should be an easy question, but I'm telling you that most, unfortunately, most uh, Christians would have a problem with that question. Do you know why? Because they don't believe that the oath that God swore in Genesis 15, remember the land was 300,000 square miles up to the Euphrates. Um, Israel have never um, owned that land. Never. And it's not just about uh, having a reach over to certain parts of certain territories, it's actually owning it, so it's part of Israel. They've never done that. Which surely ought to mean that you cannot have a theology of Israel and a theology of the way things are going to end up that excludes the fulfillment of the promise of Genesis 15. Do you see that? If you think that that's the case, then quite honestly, what we have here is a disingenuous God. We have a God who holds others to the literal performance of a covenant when he does not intend to perform what he literally swore by a self-maledictory oath by passing through the parts of those animals in Genesis 15. Because people say God's all through with national Israel in their land. Now many Christians will say, many Christian scholars will say, yeah, at the end, according to Romans chapter 11, we know that many um, Jews will be saved and, and Israel will be saved, okay? But they'll be saved into the church. No promises of the land, though. That, that's gone. No special promises for the nation of Israel. In fact, you, all, you, you even have scholars that go so far, and these are, these are main scholars. I, I might as well name some of them off. Uh, you wouldn't have heard of them, but it's for the camera. O. Palmer Robertson, uh, in his Christ and the Covenants, and his... Um, a uh, book on Israel, which basically says the church is a new Israel. He says that the land is not a major part of the Abrahamic covenant. <coughs> now, we're only in chapter 15, but, but uh, I hope that you can see that the land is the major part right now of the Abrahamic covenant. It's the big deal. What you're going to see uh, as we go through Genesis and we go through um, the prophets and so on is that the land keeps on coming up again and again and again and again. You can't get away from it. God keeps bringing it up. So, what I said about the Noahic covenant, remember, was that the Noahic covenant must mean what it says and there's nobody that doesn't believe that it means what it says. Nobody believes that God's going to bring a worldwide flood upon the earth again. Those people that are the old earthers and believe that they, it was a, a local flood, they have problems with that because God's brought lots of local floods. Um, but obviously it was a global flood and nobody who believes in a global flood believes that there's going to be another one. Why? Because they take the Noahic covenant literally. A plain uh, sense what I'm saying is that the Abrahamic covenant has even more credence. There is even more reason to date the Abrahamic covenant, particularly about the seed, the nation, and the land, both in Genesis 15. There's more reason to date that literally than there is a Noahic covenant because of what I've just described to you. 
Um, this is a problem, I'll put the word up here, if you want to uh, look at this more, um, there are some articles I wrote uh, at my blog called A Disingenuous God. Disingenuous. Disingenuous, a disingenuous person is somebody who says something that doesn't mean what they say. They prevaricate. Okay? Yes, what was your question? The um, question is, if, if, God's, if the standard that God lives by, the standard God places on himself, is that same standard that he applies to us and expects us to live by, that makes all kinds of sense. You know, and... But if God somehow lives by a completely different rule book but expects us to do what he says, it's, it's much more difficult. That's exactly right. You're exactly right. And that's why I wrote these articles, to highlight this very thing, this very problem. Um, so what have I been doing? I've been telling you there's a motif. God wor God's words equal God's actions, haven't I? I've been showing you that. And now we've added to that motif the fact that God now swears a covenant oath. So that, that the God's words, God's actions motif is now um, supplemented and reinforced by a covenant that God makes. Voluntarily, he enters, in, he enters into it. I asked you last week, why does God make covenants? He doesn't need to. His yes is yes, his no is no. Why does he do it? And one of you, I can't remember who it was, Michael, Cheryl, Michael. <laughs> one of the Millers. <laughs> came up with the fact that we have a tendency not to believe him. That's why. And guess what? Even when God swears a covenant, we don't believe him. Unless, of course, it's something that we're okay with. But if it crosses our theology, if it messes with our interpretation of the Bible, we'll just wipe it out of the way and we will say this is typological or this is spiritual or this is um, morphed in some way. And then we'll go on our pious way. Now, I'm not saying that these men, and they are good men, are going to um, miss out on heaven or anything like that. They're not. They're saved by grace. But I, I really do believe that what they do when they say that God does not mean what he says in these covenants is a very, very serious error. And it has misled the church for centuries, for centuries. And it's been the cause of a lot of wickedness and evil as well. Anti-Semitism, for example, in the church. Even today, folks, it is alarmingly true that those evangelicals that think the church is the new Israel, they tend to be more pro-Palestinian in their politics of the Middle East. It does have an impact. That's, by the way, I'm not saying that Israel, what, everything that Israel does is great. It's not. But it's still an interesting little fact. Okay. Um, if we come to a, a place like this, and we can go back to Genesis 15, if we come to a place like this and uh, we raise a question like this, which is an uncomfortable question, isn't it? And uh, Chris himself, he, he, um, he kind of put, put it in, a, in a, a very lucid way when he said, look, well, if God holds us to a position that he holds himself to, then 
that's good. If he doesn't, if he's playing with a stacked, you know, with a different deck of cards than we're playing, well, then he deals to us, then we're in trouble. So uh, at this point in the, in the uh, course, I'm, I'm kind of stopping for a bit and, and asking this question, asking you to think about this. What is it that we are saying if we say that um, most of the Old Testament, for example, is to be spiritualized or is a type of the New Testament or is a type of the cross or something like that? What is it that we're doing? I hope that you can see that what we're doing is that we're not paying attention to what God is saying in the Old Testament and in these covenants. We're not giving them the kind of authority they should have. Um, okay. So, uh, it's time for one of my drawings here. Yeah. And you know that this is a Bible. All right. So, a lot of words in the Bible, a lot of books in the Bible, a lot of things that are said in the Bible, all kinds of different things. If you're not careful, they can be seeming to go all kinds of different directions as well. Very confusing. What helps us to pull it all together? What helps us to make sense of it? Well, what I'm teaching you is that these covenants, okay, these covenants are the things that you look at and they are, as it were, signposts for the interpretation of the Bible. And I hope that you can see that you, can, you ought to fetch nothing out, out of the rest of the Bible that is going to contradict what you get from these covenants. If you get something else from the Bible that contradicts these covenants, I don't care where you go. Most of them will go to the New Testament. And so the New Testament reinterprets the Old Testament. If you do that and it cuts against what these oaths say and these are unconditional oaths. I mean, as far as God is concerned, they're unconditional, okay? Which means that he's got to perform them. Now, there may be all kinds of things he's got to do to Israel or to those recipients of it in order to put them into a position where they can receive the fulfillment. So the fulfillment may be in abeyance for millennia. But he must perform what he says because he's the only one who made the oath. So never, never, uh, when you're reading the Bible, particularly when you're reading the New Testament, never read it in conflict with the covenants that he's made in the Old Testament. Never. And if you don't understand and you can't figure it out, that's your problem. Or you can turn it around and say, how can God do this when I, he's doing this right now? And you know whose problem that is? God's problem. That's God's problem. What have you got to do? You've got to believe. All right. Any questions or any observations before we move forward here? We'll come back to this. I'll remind you of this point as well as we move forward, particularly when we get into the New Testament. Question. I, you know, um, I've struggled with Calvinism versus Arminianism, the whole, the whole deal. And to me, the way that you know, the Calvinism plays out, it turns God into something other than what I understand or what he explains as being good. And I don't, you know, that's where I haven't been able to understand if God holds himself to that same standard that he holds us to. And mm -hmm. Good means good, righteous means righteous, mm -hmm. you know, 
truth is true, you know, then I can understand who God is and his character and who he wants me to be. Yes. But if he holds himself to a different standard, I really don't have a standard to live right. by. Right. I don't want to get into the Calvinism and Arminianism <laughs> thing, but I, but I want to um, say something that maybe will help to address that and before we move on. Thank you. You're helping clarify a lot of All problems. right. Uh, it has to do with the fact that although God does use figures of speech, okay, figures of, and we, we use figures of speech too. When he's going out there and he's saying to um, Abraham, count the stars or count the sand on the seashore and so on, he's using an object lesson, isn't he? So shall your offspring be. He doesn't mean that God, uh, who knows how many stars are up there, is going to have exactly the, the same amount of Israelites to meet every star that is created. He's obviously meaning it in a figure of speech. It's a pictorial in, um, help so that it encourages the faith of, of Abraham. Okay? So we know that there are figures of speech, and yet those figures of speech do not cut across the literal interpretation. And I'm going to use that term literal, even though it can be um, misused. Most of us understand what it means unless it cuts across something that we don't like. Um, nothing that God promises in a covenant cannot come to pass if um, he has entered into it on his own unilaterally and he's bound himself to do it he's got to do it and if your theology doesn't have a place for what he's covenanted to do your theology is wrong it is i don't care how many men of men of god have believed it your theology is wrong that's a terribly arrogant thing to say hennebury you might say well i you know i'm not saying it on my authority I've given you reasons for this and you're going to see more and more that there are reasons for me to say this. So chapter 15 is all about the things that he's promised in chapter 12. He talked about descendants. Chapter 5, Abraham believed him and God accounted that faith as righteousness. Abraham did not spiritualize what God said. He did not make it a type. He believed what God was saying. When God made the covenant on ver in verse 18 and um, circumscribed the land that the descendants would be in, it was very clear where that would be to Abraham. That means that God has got to deliver on that, and he hasn't delivered so far. Okay. Chapter 17. In chapter 17, you have a, a, an interesting comparison between the two main sons of Abraham. You know that Abraham tried to help God out? He tried to spiritualize what God meant, yes, and so had a child through Hagar. Abraham did that, yeah, he tried spiritual interpretation. He tried typological interpretation. It didn't work for him. And so it says in verse, uh, well, just, just, let's just read it. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Now, notice, walk before me blameless. All right, well, that's out. Then God's off the hook, isn't he? No, because although that is somewhat of a condition, it's only a condition of when the fulfillment happens. It's not a, fulfill, it's not a condition that God can uh, get out of. Because God entered into it 
in the oath unconditionally, and the oath didn't include that. You see? If God wanted that in, he should have put it in the oath and made it a parity treaty, made it a bilateral covenant. But it wasn't a bilateral covenant. Abraham's asleep. He's not in any state to put his hand up or say yes or, you know, right on the dotted line. He can't do anything. God's put him to sleep. God is the only one who's entered into it. Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Paul uh, picks up on that, remember, in Romans 4. You shall be a father of many nations. That's true. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, or the land of Canaan. Remember we did Psalm 100 and, what was it, 106 last week. As an everlasting possession... Well, obviously God hasn't read O. Palmer Robertson or many of the covenant theologians. I will be their God. God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenants, you and your descendants after you throughout their generation. And then there's a token of the covenant now given in that circumcision, male circumcision. Eight days old. Verse 15, then God said to Abraham, Abraham, sorry, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So now Abraham's got to call his wife Sarah, which is easier to say, I think. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her, then I will, bless, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael, I've already got one, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, what's the next word? No. no. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. So it's not just... Abraham's descendants. It's now Isaac. That we've got to look for. Do you see? Now, by the way, there's no change to the covenant because God made this clear anyway. It was just Abraham trying to spiritualize God's words that got him got Ishmael on the scene. Do you see that? If he'd have believed what God said, he would have waited. Hard, isn't it? Hard to wait for God. I know, I'm terribly impatient when it comes to trusting God on stuff. <clears throat> Abraham wants, he wants the covenant to go through Ishmael. He's, he's just, you know, he loves him. God said, no. Verse 20. But as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Because God's gracious. 
Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. I will also make him a pain in the neck for you for millennia. And so, verse 21, But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. Okay, (laughs) here's a question, a Bible question. This is a question that many scholars get wrong. The Abrahamic covenant, who is it made with? Is it made with Ishmael? Is it made with Ishmael? You'd be surprised how many Christians believe that Ishmael is included in the Abrahamic covenant after reading that. I've had to point it out to pastors and you know, professors, they think that Ishmael uh, is included in the Abrahamic covenant. And I said, you haven't read Genesis 17. God is very, very clear. Ishmael is not in the Abrahamic covenant. The ones who were in the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham and Isaac. God is very clear about it. Went out of his way. Went out of his way. Yeah, he did. But you see, once you get this habit that the New Testament reinterprets the Old Testament, or however you, you know, whatever fancy words you use to do the same thing, it doesn't matter what God says. It really doesn't, because you, you, you're using uh, an interpretation that's not based on the covenants of God, not based on these oaths that God took. So, because you've got this flippy floppy kind of understanding of the Bible and that, oh yeah, everything's fulfilled at the cross. And so what we do is we, we look back into the Old Testament and we try and find the cross in the Old Testament and if the land doesn't fit in, in there, we spiritualize it. And if Israel doesn't fit in there, we spiritualize that. And if Jerusalem doesn't fit in there, we spiritualize that. And we end up spiritualizing most of the prophets and a good part of the Pentateuch. happens doesn't it you ever seen that you ever seen bible teachers go into the old testament and apply it i mean they're not just getting lessons and illustrations for christians which is perfectly right to do they're actually saying no that's what this means this is writing about the church do you see Why is that happening? I think it's happening in large part because people are not paying attention to to the covenants of God. They think that really you start in the New Testament. Once you read the New Testament, then you go back into the Old Testament to understand the Old Testament. In fact, there is a very influential biblical theologian called Graham Goldsworthy who says just that. That's what you do. He's entitled to do that. He may be a much more godly man than I am. I'm sure he's a much smarter guy than I am, but I'm not going to buy it. That's that's why we're going from Genesis to Revelation, and we're going to accrue information as we pick it up from the pages of Scripture. And what you're going to find is you're going to find a picture, a pretty clear picture, by the end of the Old Testament, you're going to have a pretty clear picture of what God intends to do. It's not going to include the church because the church is not an Old Testament phenomenon. But you're going to have a very clear picture of quite a lot of things based on God's covenant words. Okay. Notice also this in chapter 17. 
what does Ishmael get in verse 20? What does he get? Okay, so he gets, he gets a promise from God, yes? God promises to do something. What does Isaac get? Isaac gets a covenant. Please notice this. Note it in your notes. A covenant always includes promises, but a promise is not necessar necessarily a covenant. Do you see this? Covenants always include promises, but a promise is not the same thing as a covenant. Ishmael gets a promise, but he doesn't get the covenant. Why does Ishmael, I'm oh sorry, why does Isaac need the covenant if he's already included in the Abraham covenant? Because of, this, of the descendants. You're going to see that as the narrative plays out, there is a big uh, emphasis on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and that line. And why is that important? Well, because one reason might be um, that the descendants, Israel, come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you're going to see God's election, God's calling in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like you just do, you do here. But um, also because as members of the church, we're members of Christ's body, Galatians chapter 3. And because we're, Galatians, uh, we're uh, members of Christ's body, we also are children of Abraham. Paul says that, Galatians 3.16, I believe. So does that mean we're Israelites? Yes, according to many Christians that believe church is the new Israel. No, according to me, and I believe the Bible, because we, are, we may be children of Abraham by faith, but we are not children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are not descendants of them, do you see? They are Israel. That's who that covenant is made with. We enter into the part of the Abrahamic covenant that says, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's the part that Paul quotes when he applies it to the church. He doesn't quote the promise about the land or the promise about the descendants and the nationhood. Why? Because Paul differentiates these things on the basis of what God says in the covenants. Chapter 18, quickly, verses 9 and 10. Let's just read it. I, I know that we're not getting the context, but you can read the context later. Then they said to him, these are the men that come to Abraham, where is Sarah your wife? So he said here in the tent, and he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Okay, look at verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Do you see any uh, similarities between what God said in verse 10 and what God said in verse 14? It's almost verbatim. Why is that important? Because God means what he says. It's my big um, mantra, that one. God means what he says. Okay. If you hadn't picked that up. And uh, if you want a reference in this, uh, chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, which we won't be going to, but... Uh, Put the reference in there if you want to know where the fulfillment is. 
All right, let's, um, let's look at chapter 22. Now we're going on a bit now where uh, Abraham's an older man. And um, this is a key chapter in the Bible, Genesis 22. There's all kinds of stuff in this. This is really one of the most important chapters in Scripture. Genesis 15 is too, by the way. This is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. It's important for several reasons. Uh, perhaps the most important reason is because of Abraham's faith. Okay? Uh, there may be some typological stuff here, which is a proper type, because, first of all, the writer of Hebrews seems to allude to it, uh, so we're not guessing about it. And then secondly, there's a pretty obvious uh, connection also with, with Christ that we see later on. Uh, but there's also another reason as well. So you know this story. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Uh, we'll just pause there. God tested Abraham. Abraham was a guy who had been tested, but God tested him again. And I don't know about you, but I wish God wouldn't do that. Just test me once, you know, I'll fall flat on my face. He'll have to get me up by his grace, show me that he's, in, you know, that he's gracious and he's with me. And then just, just let me go on with things and not test me again, because I'm only going to do the same thing. Or sometimes I might not, depending on what I've learned. But Abraham has learned. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, look at the wording please. Look at the wording. How God turns the knife. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you. This is much, much more difficult than get out of Ur of the Chaldees and go to a land that I will show you. This is, yeah, get up to a place that I'm going to show you and take your son because you're going to sacrifice him. I mean, the, the heat's really turned up here, isn't it? Uh, Soren Kierkegaard has a, a, an interesting book called Fear and Trembling, which deals with this chapter. Um, it's very, well, worth, well worth reading. <clears throat> so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So God informed him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Well, why couldn't he take him to a mountain that was, clear, was closer so he wouldn't have to endure three days of this? Thinking about it, this preying on, on him. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Notice that. We will come back to you. Is this Abraham just kind of Throwing them off the scent. Or is there something more to it? Mm. 
And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? He knows exactly what they're going there for. Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in altar in order, and he bound Isaac his son. Do you imagine what's going through his mind here as he's binding his son? And laid him on the altar upon the wood. He's just told Isaac, God will uh, provide the lamb. I'm sure he's thinking, how on earth could God make me do this? How could God put me through it, make me um, say this to, to my son? You've got to put yourself in this situation, folks. Okay? This is not just a nice Bible story for kids. This is an extremely intense, is a heart-wrenching situation. This taxed Abraham to his limit. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He's going to do it. Does anybody here think he's not going to do it? He's going to do it. All right, why is he going to do it? Here we are, We're, we've stopped the, the film here. Okay, so he's like this. Plenty of great paintings about, uh, that have been done on this. Why is he doing it? Because, because he believes, okay, because he believes the covenant. What does the covenant say? It says, well, yeah, but... Through who? Through That's right. Okay, well, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. You need to help me out here. Because if he kills Isaac, how on earth can that come to fruition? Maybe because he just believes God. He doesn't understand how God's going to do it. So whose problem is it? God. It's God's problem. It's God's problem, folks. What's Abraham to do? What would you do? I'll tell you what I'd do. This would be a great time for spiritualization. <laughs> okay? This would be a great time for, uh, you know, getting a sheep, <laughs> calling it Isaac, <laughs> and putting it on the altar. <laughs> Yes? You'd, <laughs> you'd be tempted to do that, wouldn't you? I would. Abraham's not. Abraham's a man of faith. You know the sequel. I'll just finish it off and then we'll go to Hebrews and close <clears throat> but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said Abraham Abraham and he said here I am and he said do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him for now I know that you fear God now what is it to fear God here in this context, it is to do what God says, even when it's really, really difficult. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, God's well away, hasn't forgotten, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. He even told the truth to his son. God didn't make him a liar. 
<coughs> and it's called the um, Yahweh Yireh, the Lord will provide. Okay, to Hebrews quickly, chapter 11. Actually, we've... I think we're going to finish early tonight. <clears throat> You're probably all there before me. This is the faith chapter, okay? Chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Now you see what the writer of Hebrews is doing here is he's, he's showing us what the test was about. God had said it's going to be through Isaac. In fact, Abraham had even tried to spiritualize it. He'd offered a spiritual interpretation to God. Let it be Ishmael. God said, no, it's going to be Isaac. And then what does God turn around and do some years later? Go and sacrifice Isaac. Doesn't make any sense. That's the problem with faith, isn't it? That's the problem often with trusting God. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. If God would know about it as much as we knew about it, he wouldn't be handling it the way he was handling it. That's how we think. <laughs> In Isaac, your seed shall be called. Now look at this. Concluding, concluding here. Reasoning that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. Why did he reason that way? How can he reason that way? Uh, what's, what's driving his reason? Can you see that? His faith is driving the way he thinks. His faith is driving the way he reasons. What are we tempted to do? What are we often told to do? Reason, drives faith. Reason driving our faith. So what we'll do is that we'll, uh, you know, we'll say something in our apologetics, for example, we'll say, well, God probably exists. And we can reason to a God, and then we can believe the, go to the Bible to find out who that God is, and then we'll have faith in him. That's the wrong way around. The Bible confronts us with the true God, the only true God, not any old God, because any old God is idolatry. And idolatry is always wrong. So faith in the God of Scripture, guides our reason. Because after all, God knows what his world's about. He knows what we're about, doesn't it? When we try to figure things out for God, we usually, well, always, end up in a pickle, don't we? and feel foolish because we find out that God didn't need us to figure it out at all. He had it all figured out anyway. He just didn't tell us about how he was going to do it. And the challenge was that we, had, we should have withheld our reasoning, you know. God's not interested in combining his mind with mine. Having some kind of a committee meeting on how we're going to do it. God knows how he's going to do it. What does he expect us to do? Believe that he knows how to do it. That's faith. faith is faith reasonable? It's always reasonable. 
Faith is always reasonable. It's never blind. Never blind. But as Augustine would say, he put it in a different way, through faith we understand. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says that too. Or I believe in order to understand. That's what, uh, that's what Augustine said. But look at this. This is what faith does. Faith latches on to what God says and believes it, even against all of the evidence. Believes it. Now, <clears throat> so uh, let's just you know, highlight this. Didn't give myself a lot of room. Can you see that? Faith needs the plain sense. Why does it need the plain sense? Why does it have to take a literal, if you like, interpretation? Why? Because it has to know what to believe. Folks, Abraham here is a paragon of faith because he took God at his word. Because the temptation to kill the sheep and call it Isaac didn't occur to him like it might have occurred to me. The temptation to... Well, all kinds of different euphemisms are used nowadays in the literature. People that... The, the, they used to call it spiritualizing, but the modern writers don't like that word. Some of them do. Goldsworthy's okay with it, for example. But a lot of the American evangelicals don't like that, so they like expansion or transformation or theological interpretation. That has big currency at the moment. It's spiritualization. It's, it's saying that God doesn't mean what he says. It's, so, look, folks, this is where we're going to end. Uh, so give me uh, five minutes. Oh, notice, I, sorry, I, I, I uh, rubbed that out. We will come again to you. There's Abraham's faith. He was expecting to have to kill his son but he knew that God would raise him up again and they'd come back together. Why? Because of the covenant. God had to. God had committed to do it through Isaac. If he kills him, he's going to have to raise him up again. See how faith drove his reason? Concluding, you see. Um, When I get in a pickle like that, or I, my faith gets challenged, I very often try to figure out how God's going to do it. He can either do it this way, this way, this way, this way, or this way. And I don't think he's going to do it any of those ways, so then I start panicking. Yes? So I'm, I'm not very much like Abraham. <clears throat> um, faith needs to play sense. It needs to believe what God says. Because if it doesn't believe what God says, it doesn't know what to believe. Now, God has made covenants. Covenants are, as I've, I've said, they are uh, reinforcements of plain speech about something important. Or amplifications of plain speech about something important. But it is plain speech. It's just saying it louder and more, with more emphasis. That's what covenants do. You know, they're all about clarity. Covenants are hermeneutical. In other words, they're, they're all about interpretation. You having the same interpretation as me. And agreeing on it and swearing an oath about it. Um, 
So okay, get, let's get back to this. God wants you to have faith. In fact, in uh, verse 6 in Hebrews 11, it says, Without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please him. Impossible. That means when you don't feel like believing him, you've got to believe him. Why? Because God is not disingenuous. Because God really does mean what he says and you can take it to the bank. Even when you can't see where the bank is and you don't know the way to the bank, you can still take it there and you'll end up there and it, and it will be deposited just where God wants it. God really does mean what he says. The practical implications for the Christian life, for the life of faith, the life of difficulty, I hope that you can see are, are very, very important. Because look, um, I know that when uh, an ISIS soldier has got a sword born in, in front of me to chop my head off, which I hope doesn't happen, but um, if that kind of thing happens, and it is happening to brothers and sisters, I want to believe what God says, and I don't want to be thinking, okay, did God really mean what he said then? To be absent from the body, it, does it mean I'm going to be present with the Lord in just a few moments? Does it mean... To be with God is far better? Yes, it does, you see. That's where it really becomes important. When you lose someone dear, when your faith uh, is tried because of your ill health uh, or a crushing disappointment or unemployment or any of these things, when people misunderstand you and vilify you, when you've got all kinds of problems going on. God means what he says. I counsel people. I counsel Christians. I was counseling one today with depression. My counseling is useless if God doesn't mean what he says. I don't want him to believe me and my interpretations of this. I want to point him to this away from me and say, look at that. Read it and believe it. Do it. It will change you. I hope that I've made my point. Um, next week we'll move on and we'll look how uh, um, Isaac and, and Jacob and then move on to, uh, we should be able to get on to uh, Jacob's words to his sons in Genesis 49 next week. I don't expect you necessarily to read the rest of Genesis. If you can, that's fine. We're up to 22, so we're halfway through. Um, but if you want to read uh, chapter 26 and then a little bit in uh, the 30s, you know, 33, 32, 33 uh, in there, uh, the Joseph stuff is good. You don't have to read that stuff, but do read chapter 49.